Testing, we good? Oh, okay. okay. All right. I think are we we're live on YouTube? Yep, we are live. We're live. Oh boy. All right. Um, wow, it's loud. <laughs> I uh, wanted to welcome everybody that's here, and it, uh, one of the big things we wanted to do this was record this so it goes online. So those of you that are joining online, thank you for joining, and that it is recorded for those that are going to use it in the future. I know we've had a lot of families abroad and um, have, are incoming to Bowles that have asked about this as a resource. So one of the things we wanted to do was make sure we did it in here so we could have a uh, recording of this um, to work through. So I'm um, talking to everybody that's out there and the people are going to watch in the future. I'm excited to do this again this year. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than we've done in the past. This is an area um, that our coaching staff sat down and said we wanted to make a dedicated effort of getting better at um, this process for our program. Um, and we're already pretty good at it. And that's not a, a brag, but I mean, it, in, in statistics terms, very few people, uh, as low as 7%, go on to play a varsity sport in college. And if you look at our program, we have uh, I think the, the, on our board right now, we have 20 college commits out of a class of just under 40. So we're well ahead of 50% of our program here ends up swimming in college. So this is a big part of what we do at Bowls. It is not the biggest thing we do at Bowls. We're about development of the person and the, and the uh, enjoyment of the sport. But it is important that we, we try to facilitate this part of our program and uh, this journey for our student athletes. So um, Tonight, we are going to go through a lot of information. So it is going to, um, we're going to cover a whole lot of different topics. We're going to try to break it into several segments, um, just trying to make sure that uh, we address kind of uh, parents, we're going to address students, then we're going to address kind of this concept of what the best fit for everybody is. Um, we'll have some time at the end for a couple odds and ends. And then uh, if you have questions, my request would be, if you're, if you're here, you can welcome to ask us afterwards. But if you are online or watching later, please email us, because if you have a question and it's something that's pertinent to other people, we would love to answer that. Um, so that being said, I'm going to dive in. We're going to try to keep this moving. As quick as we can, like I said, this is a lot of information. So uh, we'll have the PowerPoint available online, and we'll have the uh, video available online for reference. But uh, looking forward to uh, sharing all of that with everybody here and online. Um, so the first thing I want to start with is uh, just a couple of key points, and mostly for the students that are in the room or listening online. Uh, if you're talking about swimming in college, it is a challenging endeavor. It is designed to be challenging. It is a difficult thing to do. It is something that you have to step into, lean into. You have to love the process of swimming. Um, if you are somebody that uh, does not love coming to practice, working hard, pushing yourself, trying to fix your strokes, challenge it, you know, get stronger, all of the pieces of those things, and compete, uh, college swimming is not going to be a good fit for you. And it doesn't mean it's, it's you're, something's wrong with you or anything like that, but I just want to point out that as we're watching the world of college swimming grow and the sport of swimming grow, uh, the performance levels are getting higher, the commitment levels are getting higher. Um, what is expected of student athletes is becoming more and more, and it's okay for us to acknowledge it is a difficult and challenging endeavor. Now, that being said, um, I want to make sure that we feel that that challenge and that endeavor is worth every step. The, the, the moments you get with your teammates, the growth you get from being a part of that team, the challenge you get physically, um, the challenge of balancing your schedule. We just recently had a Bulls alumni come and talk to the team, and he referenced how he felt that he could do anything in his business world because of the background swimming gave him, and that's what we want to uh, push for and strive for, and I think it's one of the reasons that college swimming is so important. However, it is something we need to identify. It is challenging. It is hard to do. So if you're not in on that process and you're not committed to it um, and love doing that, it's something you really need to, to wrestle with. Let's have a meeting with a coach and talk to as you kind of get into it. Um, parents, um, I want to say if there's one thing you get out of this presentation, if there's one thing you can take away from this, it is that the best fit for your student athlete is the most important thing, and that is not the best school. Okay, and we get this every year. We walk through this every year. Um, it is easy to get pigeonholed and stuck into a trap of thinking about what the best possible brand name school out there is for a student athlete, and that's great. We want to strive for some of those opportunities, but that doesn't mean that it's the best experience for your student athlete. And what I mean by that is when you have a student athlete that goes to a college program and they get the opportunity to compete, uh, they get a connection with a coach and a team that they enjoy, uh, when they get to be successful in that, in that opportunity, then the experience they have is one that creates the growth in those things we talk, those intangible things that go beyond the sport, right? When they are in a position where they have to 
fight and scrap and claw, and maybe they don't get the time and attention, and they're in a, in a position where they're slightly beyond what their their real capabilities are, um, that experience is not helpful for that student athlete. We often see a lot of times that's where you develop stress and undue anxiety from some things, uh, from again, from the academic world they're working through. So parents, please, we hope we can give you some tools on working through what the best fit is for your student athlete. Um, and as we work through this, I hope you, you can see what we're talking about. So um, that being said, um, our objectives for the night, um, so how do I, there we go, there we go. Um, are we, we really want to go through and understand a timeline uh, for everybody, for both students and parents, just making sure that uh, we understand what the time, the time frame is. We're, we're talking primarily to sophomores right now because sophomores are uh, coming up on the time when they can begin contact with, uh, begin the recruiting process or the selection process with college coaches. But there's a little bit more to that timeline. We'll go through that in a second. Um, second thing is, you know, students, we want you to accept responsibility. We want to give you the tools to accept responsibility for this process. It is your process to do. Your parents cannot do it for you. We cannot do it for you. What you put into this will be the, what you get out of it. And it is really important that coming out of this, that our student athletes take ownership of that process and work through it. Um, Finally, student athletes need to develop some awareness of where they are and what that best fit's going to be, and then have some th things that they can take action and uh, move forward. So that's our objectives for our students. For parents, again, understanding the timeline is critically important. Uh, knowing what support looks like for your student athlete in this process is what we want to get out of tonight. And then developing, again, the same thing, developing some awareness of how do we find that best fit um, and how do we start that process? It's really easy. I make the joke all the time. There's a lot of people that we say, hey, look, let's go uh, make your top list of top 20 schools and they'll go to ESPN. Uh, give me football. What's the top list of 20, 1 through 20? Here's my list, right? So that's not what we want to do. Uh, we work on finding the best fit from there. So, or swimming, but sometimes it is football for those in the South. Um, so, yeah, so that's what we want to try to get through tonight. Like I said, it's a lot of information. We're trying to get through all of it. So, uh, prayer perspective why do we want to compete in college? Uh, I've kind of touched on a couple of these things already, but it can help, you know, somebody can help pay for college, for sure. Um, it's going to help, you know, as you're going through this process, it's going to help you keep track of um, your application. Like going through this process as a student athlete, you're going to have a little bit more um, contact with that admissions office, with the coach, knowing what applications are going in, where you're going to be. Able. There's just a little bit more structure around that, so it really helps in the admissions process. Um, you're going to get better... Uh, Opportunities as a student athlete. We hope we want to we want to open some doors. Being an athlete that maybe otherwise would not be open to you. Um, sport programs are required to help you graduate. So if you're a Division One athlete, uh, there's actually a requirement to graduate, or they that program gets dinged um, or deducted points. There's actually a point system. Um, you lose enough points, you can be penalized scholarship dollars. So coaches actually are incentivized to make sure you graduate. So if you are swimming in college um, at any level. Uh, there is a coach that's invested in you graduating. There's, there's not just a, uh, a you know, they're going to see you in the door and out, but they want to make sure you're actually uh, getting the opportunity to graduate from that institution or another one if it's a grad school or a fifth year or something like that. Um, you can get the opportunity to attend a school that may have more non-traditional path to goals. So you have, you know, different, diff we're going to talk a lot about the different branches of school and what's out there and then uh, go from that standpoint. Um, the big thing I think is probably the most underrated one is the uh, providing a team environment for your student athlete. So as you are, um, as a student athlete goes to college, one of the biggest reasons you should be in college athletics is because when you walk on campus, no matter what level you're at, you have a group of 30 athletes that are invested in your success. You have a team of coaches that are invested in your success. Um, we're looking to get through that. I said this earlier, about 7% of high school athletes go on to play sports at any level. Um, we tend to have a few more percentage-wise here at Bowles. So we get a little jaded into thinking this is a really normal thing. It's actually not. It's an extreme uh, – it's a, it's a great opportunity, but it is not common for a lot of people, and we want to make that more common for us uh, as we go through it. Um, the sports college alumni networks after college are some of the most connected ones in college. There's a lot of doors and op opportunities we can go there. So there are parents out there that, that we, we talk to and I'm just going to be as blunt as I can uh, for the, the sake of the presentation and making sure everybody understands that we'll say, well, if, if my swimmer is not going to swim here, then it's not worth swimming. You know, or it's not worth swimming, we're going to go to this college instead. If they don't get a chance to go to XYZ University, then we're just not going to swim. And I would encourage you to realize that there's a lot of different reasons why you should compete in college, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with competing at the best college. Um, I think having that opportunity to go and experience some of these other benefits is going to be really, really important. So... 
Uh, talk a little bit about financial aid next. Um, so this is a quick rundown. As you can see, financial aid is a really difficult concept to understand. Um, it can be really challenging to uh, the way that it works and the nuances behind it can be really difficult. And I don't want to get all the way into that right now. But just understand that financial aid from an athletic standpoint, from a college standpoint, um, it can look a lot of different ways depending on the institution you're going to, what the level of the institution is, and what we're working on. So uh, this just gives you a quick quick rundown and kind of general categories. But a, you know, more often than not, we tend to think a lot of people are on athletic financial aid. It's really not the case. Uh, financial aid offers are not that common or not as common as you would think. Um, swimming is what we call a division one level is called a uh, partial it's not it's a partial scholarship sport so for example a football is a non-partial sport you either a full ride or zero swimming is a partial sport um, on the men's side in division one you're allowed 9.9 .9 scholarships which means they're dividing 9.9 .9 scholarships between 25 swimmers the chance of you earning a full ride is very 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 slim even at the best institutions even at the best swimmers right um, it's really a, a challenge to do that. So from a financial aid standpoint, understanding all the different nuances to it are really important. Um, again, I'll let you read through this a little bit. Uh, yes, there's different aspects to, to uh, what you would consider to be a recruited student athlete or recruited walk-on um, or just walking on. But I want you to think a little bit beyond that in terms of, you know, does the financial aid opportunity the university presents, um, it can be in combination with athletic aid. In some cases, you cannot combine those two things. In some cases, you can. Um, there's a lot of nuance that goes into it. Now we've got a new thing out there called the NIL, name, image, and likeness. Um, there's money out there you can get. Some institution can give you cash for living expenses. It depends on the university's budget. That is an institution to institution dis um, decision along with the NIL. And so those things are, are not going to be necessarily comparable from one school to the next. So my last point with financial aid is you got to be really careful and understand that a scholarship offer between two schools is like comparing an apple and an orange. 20% at one school does not equal 20% at another school. And I don't mean that in terms of dollar value. I mean that in terms of what they value in their program, right? A school is only going to be able to offer, whether it's academic, athletic, or otherwise, um, they're only going to be able to offer a certain amount. So what I want you to take out of this is that you cannot use that as a comparison tool to understand where the best fit is. It is certainly an aspect that needs to be considered. It's one of the biggest areas that we all consider as parents uh, in terms of the cost of the, the, the education. Uh, but it should not be something you use to directly compare one institution versus another. It should be thought of as an aspect of that university, how they do financial aid, what's available there, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the recruiting timeline. So uh, next slide has, it's going to be kind of like, uh, yeah, there we go. So it's going to be, again, school to school, athlete to athlete. I think this is the area where, uh, again, for the room and the broad general, for parents especially, uh, we get caught up in seeing what's on Swim Swam. We see what's announced out there. We see peers that decide something. Um, there is still a long process to go for a lot of people through this. So they start June 15th of, after their sophomore year, and they will not make a decision. We had a, a summer this week that made their decision on where they're going to go as a senior. Um, this is mid-April. So uh, they're talking about almost two years to go all the way through that full process, right? Um, yes, there are summers out there that are part of our national junior team in the U.S. They're going to get recruited and make a decision within two days of June 15th. I understand that's a reality. That's what out there. Um, there's also going to be people that start the process there, and they're going to get faster, and they're going to look at different schools as they go through their uh, senior or their junior year. Um, so there is not a specific timeline to each person, um, but it is really important that we kind of work through this. So starting in January, um, I would say beginning of the year, your sophomore year, so specifically for sophomores, um, this is where you should register, number one, just a simple task, register with the NCAA. Um, it's actually a really important as part of this process is so the way this works. There's an NCAA eligibility center out there. Um, it will, uh, you go to that website. I think there's a small fee. You'll register there. They're going to determine you're an amateur status, uh, your amateurism status. They're also going to determine um, you're academically eligible, that kind of thing. And so when you complete that process on the other side, on the coaching side, they are able to access a database of who, who is eligible and who isn't, who is in what year and what is not, so they know that you are a legitimate student athlete. They cannot bring you on a recruiting trip or offer you a benefit without 
uh, going through that process. So make sure you register with the Eligibility Center early in your sophomore year. If you haven't done that already, we need to do it now. Um, starting June 15th, this is when rising juniors, so you finish your sophomore year, this is when rising juniors can make a contact with a college coach. So this is where they can take a phone call, receive a text message, send a DM, I get that right? Um, send a DM, they can uh, talk to that person in person. Prior to that, they are not supposed to have direct contact with a college coach. So even if they were to walk down the street at, outside of Orlando, they're down at a meet, and they walk down the street and they see a uh, coach standing there at the university and they can walk up and say hello and that coach should say, hey, it's great to meet you. I'm really glad you're interested. I can't talk to you right now. I look forward to talking to you after June 15th, right? It's not anything wrong with that. You can still exchange pleasantries. Um, all that kind of stuff is fine, but just know that June 15th is a point when you can have an official contact point. Um, August 1st is when rising years can now begin visiting colleges. So you can't take an official visit prior to August 1st um, of, before your junior year. So that's when you can take that first official visit. And it doesn't mean you need to take an official visit then. It's just when the first allowable date is. Um, November 8th is all the way, and we're jumping all the way ahead to your senior year. So just let me put it this way. So you start June 15th after your sophomore year. Okay, you can start taking official visits um, August 1st before your junior year. The entire duration of your junior year um, is an opportunity to visit and talk with coaches, but nothing is official. Even a commitment at that point is only verbal. Nothing becomes official until November 8th, right around there, your first signing date um, in early November of your senior year. That is when you would actually sign a letter of intent. That is if you're receiving athletic financial aid. If you're walking on or going to a school, like a Division three school that doesn't have, offer athletic financial aid, that process is going to follow the admissions timeline. Okay, So November 8th is when it, you're, you would actually have it in writing. That process would be complete no matter what. Um, and it, there are signing dates after November 8th. You don't have to sign by November 8th, but that is the first one available to make it official. Um, and then June 30th would be the last day for a senior to decide where they're going to attend school. So that's obviously partially into the summer. Um, you do have a few schools with rolling admissions windows after that. But for the most part, um, NCAA, June 30th, your senior year is your last day. And there will be people that make that decision in June, in May of their senior year. So we want to make sure we're aware of that and, and working through that. So again, I think it's really important to understand that what we see out there or what we hear from other people isn't necessarily what defines a timeline. Um, our timeline should be set by going through, and we're going to go through a little checklist of items in a little bit about what's important to kind of go through. But uh, it's really up to you to kind of make sure you make a good decision based on the timeline you have. And we want to be supportive in, in our student athletes and making sure they have all the information to make a decision, regardless of when that might be. Okay. All right, parents on how to support athletes. So um, I'm going to go through some do's and don'ts, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, – I'm going to make, make fun of it a little bit, but I want to make sure we get the point across. This can be a really, really stressful uh, experience. Um, more often than not, the breakdowns we see, the anxiety we see on our end, um, comes from a perceived pressure from the student athlete by either parents or peers uh, in the college process. And I have not yet met a parent that doesn't want the best for their child. I have every single parent I've ever met in swimming always wants the best for their child. They just don't always know how to express it. Um, so it's really, really important that we take a step back. I just want to give you some pointers on how to support a student athlete through this process. Um, and then student athletes, there's going to be some things you need to do on your side as well to make sure this works well. And it really comes down to an excessive amount of communication. Um, it's early and often just sitting down and getting some clear boundaries on what this looks like, what your values are, where you want to go, what this, this process might play out to be, and then being able to kind of check in regularly in a way that does not feel like there's a lot of pressure. So having fun with that, uh, enjoying it, thinking about it as like a family vacation. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot to enjoy and a lot to soak up, but I want to make sure we're having a good time as we do it. Um, parents, it would be really important to communicate major financial concerns early. Um, we've, we've experienced in the past where we have, you know, student athletes begin this process. We get really excited. We've got our bits of five schools and we go through it. And four of our five schools are financially out of reach for that family. And we're just kind of hoping that maybe everything will work out. And then all of a sudden that fifth school, which we thought was going to be great, all of a sudden they say, yeah, actually we don't have a spot for you. So now we're down to four schools and none of them work financially and we're back to square one. Right? It is really important to communicate with your student athlete. And you don't have to give them the details, but communicate what's a reasonable expectation um, as far as finances go uh, so, as, so we can help as well in terms of making sure we're guiding them in the right direction. Um, parents would love you to be open-minded 
in terms of the schools you're looking at. I think it's really easy, again, to get caught up in the name brand schools uh, that we see a lot of, but the experience you can have at a another school or a different school can be far outweigh the brand name uh, that maybe we get used to. And um, again, we want to support our student athletes to reach for some schools that are known for their academic rigor, they're known for their different programs. We want that to be a part of what we do at Bowles, but it should not be the priority. The priority should still be the best fit for that student athlete. Be open-minded and talk through what the benefit of that program, get involved in what the experience for that student athlete's gonna be and what it's gonna look like. Um, It'd be really good to let your student athlete talk freely with either us as coaches or the college coaches. So not trying to guide exactly what they're going to say. We're, what we'll try to do is give them a list of questions, um, give them prompts so they can talk to, to co coaches as best they can. But want to make sure as parents that you let them have that conversation. The biggest turnoff for a college coach is a parent or a student athlete who's parent is driving the conversation that they that tells them that they aren't independent enough to be successful at that school uh, parents I hate to break it to you but once your swimmer goes to college that that coach is going to have very very little interaction with you um, that that tripod of, of athlete parent and coach that is you know already starting to drift apart a little bit in the high school years is going to become completely separated in the college years right they're expecting to work solely with that student athlete and they, they will sense that if you're taking over those conversations or driving those conversations, that they, that's not somebody that's going to be able to be successful in their program. Um, it would be a really good idea for parents if you were to meet with their club coach, meaning us. A phone call is fine. Talking through who, where do we think your student athlete is going to fit? What are some of the benefits that the schools are looking at? What are the, some of the drawbacks? Uh, we would love to have that conversation with you. I know it's a lot of work for us to squeeze in and get that in, but that is really, really important. Like I said at the beginning, it's an area we want to do better at as a program. So we welcome that conversation, um, that opportunity to talk with you about it. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of not things to do. Um, I think one of the one of the easy ones to point out there is just that, that doomsday mentality of you know threatening kids. Well, you're never going to be successful if you don't pick up your room, if you don't get to practice on time, if you don't learn to wake up. Right? That those little hits over and over again are things that start to build up anxiety and start to build up. Um, you know, and again, I know we mean well when we do that, and we're, we're guilty as coaches. Well, you're not going to be able to get into so and so if you don't hurry up a little bit on this set. Right? Like it's easy to say that. Um, but it's also incredibly devastating, right? It's easy. We've got to watch what we say, and just like that, I would like parents to think the same way. Um, it's really important to get ahead on that financial aid conversation. Like I said earlier, it's, it's not having that conversation really puts it in mind, and it puts that student athlete in a spot where they've got to go ask for money or support in an area where they're not going to get it, and it can really make for some unpleasant conversations, some anxiety down the road. So have that conversation early. Um, a lot of parents will do this. They'll have a restricted list. We're going to go to these five schools. This is what I want to do. Um, and this can come all the way down to, um, you know, I attended UVA, and I don't want my son or daughter to go anywhere near Virginia Tech, right? Um, it, you know, I, I went to Georgia. I'm going to have a really hard time if my kids like Florida. It's, it's just going to be a struggle. Um, but it's a great school, so I'm going to have to get over that if that's the path they choose. But it's uh, just an example of – where parents can sometimes start to list out the schools they think they need to go to, and it's really important to let the student athlete kind of develop that list on their own. Um, one of the big ones we get on our end, and this is really frustrating as parents, as, as our swimmers are starting to have conversations with coaches, okay, a lot of that conversation is simply getting to know them. And so it is really a whole lot of chit-chat. It, it's, it's how was your day? What was your school like? How was practice today? What are your friends doing? What do you do on the weekend? Um, those coaches are just trying to get to know those student athletes. Usually in a phone call, they may have one or two pointed questions for the student athlete, and our student athlete might have one or two questions for them. And a 40-minute phone call could be filled up with a lot of just getting to know them. Hey, what do you like? What kind of food do you eat? Oh, we got this really cool place at our campus, and our dining hall is great. And they kind of go back and forth on that. So when the student athlete hangs up the phone, and you want to know what the details of that call are, in their mind, they might not have a lot to share with you. And that's okay. Okay. Um, just understand that you don't need to know every single detail or demand every single detail of those conversations because a lot of that is, um, you know, there are some important things you want to have. And again, I would advise you early on in the process to sit down and say, here's the things that would help me to understand where you're at. Because a lot of times those coaches are going to call and they're going to say, hey, it was great to talk to you. Let's set up another call in a couple of months to see how you're doing. And there's no real progress or seemed, seems to be any real progress in that call, whereas adults, we look at that and go, if you had a phone call, you had to get something out of it, right? There's a point to that meeting. There had to be an end point there. You had to get somewhere with it. And that's okay if there's not necessarily that going on. A lot of it's just building relationships and letting them get a feel for what that student athlete is. Now, we wanted to give our student athletes some good questions to ask to help drive that process a little bit faster, 
But just keep in mind as parents, when you go and ask them for every detail of a visit or every detail of a phone call, um, I know you're going to get one word responses. It was fine. It was good. Uh, whatever it is, but just understand that there's not as much going on there as you might think. And if you really have an issue with it, have that conversation with them where you sit down and say, Hey, you know, I, I would like to know a little bit more about what's going on. How do you feel about this? Okay. Um, we have it listed, but it's, it goes without saying, but just try not to panic um, through this. <laughs> there's going to be some points where everybody panic, And this is the point where I'm going to tell everybody I have yet to go through this process with any family in my entire coaching career, and they look back on this and they go, wow, that went exactly like I thought it would. I have yet to have that happen. I hope this group is the first, but I, I also don't think it's reality. I think you have to understand that this process has twists, turns, bumps, and bridges, and things that you just don't see coming, and it's okay. That's part of it. Uh, so just know that it's, you know, panicking about it, feeling like you're behind, ask for help when you need help, and make sure we have that communication going so that we can, we can work through it. Um, so I'm going to walk through athletes just a little bit more on the timeline. So freshman year, um, athletics is pretty simple. Just train hard. Uh, just kind of getting started from the program. Again, you're getting your feet wet. Just start listening. Put your ears out for what's going on in the college world. Academics, um, there's some targets up here. Uh, you want them to keep your GPA up. Start your GPA high. The law of averages, if you start your GPA in a good place, it's a lot easier to keep it there. So freshman year academics are really, really important. Um, learning to balance your work and starting and thinking, hey, a little bit, hey, it's not just about freshman year. It's about where do I want to be as a senior. Um, it's some, the to-do stuff is pretty simple. Um, it's really just learning to, you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with colleges, but just little things like your social media doesn't need to be, party centric. I hope it's not, but again, you're, that will be looked at as part of your, your recruiting process. You need to make sure that's in a good spot, right? So not much there. Se sophomore year, uh, just remember June 15th is your key date. Um, but again, athletically, we're trying to get down to four to six events. Uh, we're trying to move towards multi-day competition. Again, college coaches are looking for a championship swimmer. It means three to five days, multiple events, multiple relays. They're not looking for one swim. They're not looking for you can do a great swim in a time trial. They're looking, can you handle a championship meet? Why we as a program focus on championship meets. We try to build those into our program as part of what we do. Um, it's really important you get prepared for that. Um, understanding your training and what your responsibility is as a sophomore year is like where do you what do you bring to the table is really, really important. That's going to be a lot of the questions you get asked when you start talking after your, your fresh sophomore year. They're going to want to know what you bring to the table as far as training goes. Um, and then just making sure academically we're taking care of PSATs, uh, plan out when you want to take your test. We try to put those on our meet calendar when we put it out as best we can um, and make sure that you talk to counselors about you know your eligibility, especially some of our international students, um, just making sure we walk through NCAA eligibility academically. There are requirements. You can go to the NCAA.org website. There's a page on how the requirements are academically. Um, the school here knows about it. Most of your high school counselors know um, what that looks like and how to make sure you're set up for that success. Okay. Uh, make sure you do register for the NCAA Eligibility Center. And as you finish your sophomore year, we're going to talk about this a little more later, but you need to fill out your recruiting forms, um, make a list of schools. Again, that's coming up in the next couple of months for you guys. And then getting, getting uh, prepared for those conversations. So it really accelerates quickly at the end of your sophomore year. Um, it's kind of where we want to be. All right, junior year. Um, again, athletically, we're, we're trying to get to the highest meets we can. Uh, we're in the middle of that recruiting or selection process. Uh, it is really important that you keep your focus as an athlete on the process you've already been going through. So being a great teammate. When a college coach comes to visit our campus, um, a lot of times what they're looking for is body language. They're looking for engagement. They look for listening. One of the most you know, one of the comments we'll get the most, and if it's a good day, uh, from a visiting coach is, wow, they really listen well. They were dialed in. They heard what you were saying. They're watching to see if those student athletes are listening, if they're paying attention, if they're in where they're supposed to be. Um, what are they doing before practice? I know several coaches have told us they watch what an athlete does before they get in the water. They watch what an athlete does when they get out of the water. Those are important things. That tells them where their mindset is and what that athlete's trying to do uh, as they go through the process. So athletics, trying to, trying to grow those habits, trying to become that leader within the program. Um, I think it's, again, take another step as far as your training, being able to articulate that, understand it. You need to take your – academically, you need to take your SA, ACT and SAT, um, and you can talk to your counselor about what's appropriate for that for the schools you're looking at up to three times. Um, there's some places you can get. We have some people connected to our program to help you with tutoring for that. Uh, get ready for those things. And, we, again, we try to find dates, and we, we can make sure you have uh, dates you can plan on taking those tests uh, around our swim meet. So 
Um, otherwise, uh, to-do list, this is where it gets really busy. Juniors, if you're a sophomore right now, you're sitting in the room, uh, managing a lot more conversations can be very overwhelming, right? Just managing the text. It is important that you return texts and emails in a timely manner. Um, it's not sitting on a text for two or three days or a week and then, oh, and I forgot, now it's awkward to get back to them. Being able to stay on top of that is also the year when your academics kick way up. Okay, your highest course load is usually your junior year. Um, so it is a really big year on a lot of fronts, and it's important to kind of get ready for that. Uh, but I think it is, it is important to understand that this process does take additional time. It takes time and effort. It takes emails. It takes filling out questionnaires. It takes research. It takes phone calls. Uh, being able to be a little bit better with your time management is going to be critical your junior year uh, as you get into it. All right. Um, there are some people that are possibly going to make a decision uh, in their junior year, and that's okay. I want to support that if that's the best thing for them. But again, we'll talk about what the checklist looks like and later on get there. So senior year, um, what is different and is changing about this process as people commit a little bit earlier is that there is still an, an unspoken agreement that you're going to continue to improve after that commitment or during that recruiting process, right? So it used to be that seniors made their decision in November. They would, they would do all the recruiting trips to follow their senior year. They make their decision in November, and then you've got about four or five months to kind of get through before summer hits and you're getting ready for college. Uh, that window has opened up now to two years in some cases. Um, and the expectation is that not this, you know, where they're recruiting you is that you're going to continue to improve. So having a plan with your coach about what that next step is for you after that process is over, what that next big meet is. I'm really proud of our team this year. We have a lot of our seniors committed to go to our highest level meets at the end of the summer. Um, that's a huge step and something we set out to talk about with our team a couple years ago. So watching that process grow, that's, that's folding into what uh, this process is and making sure that we're prepared to go on to the next level. Um, Pushing yourself in the weight room in the pool, trying to get ready for uh, the, the, the workload that colleges demand. It doesn't matter what program you're going to. By and large, you will see an increase in training uh, when you go to college. That is by design. It should in result in an increase in performance as well. We, we do about 16 hours of training a week, give or take, all groups. Um, and then in college, you can go up to 20 right for the most part so you're going to see an increase in training there's does mean some additional things on top of that but uh, notice your class time is going to go down most people go to class for about six hours a day uh, in high school you'll be doing roughly 15 hours a week in college right so getting ready for that uh, preparing yourself by you know, both academically and athletically as you go through it maintaining your GPA is really important I think we're getting to the point now where colleges are going to be able to pull offers if needed and it's it's not going to be a pleasant opportunity for them especially with the transfer portal and that out there so making sure we stay on top of that is going to be really important um, your signing day will come at some point whether you're athletically signing off for financial aid or just accepting an, app, uh, an offer or accepting admission to swim at that university. That should happen in your senior year. Um, and I think the biggest thing in, in finishing good, well through high school in terms of behavior, um, there will undoubtedly be a story somewhere out there of a senior who made a poor decision, uh, usually in their last couple months of school, and it's going to cost them a spot on that team. It's going to cost them a spot uh, that they worked really, really hard for. Um, so character does matter. College coaches are in a position where, you know, the the success of that team is based on is it provides their livelihood, right? And it push comes to shove, uh, they're they're going to put their family ahead of your inability to make the right decisions. So proving to them you can make the right decisions is really really important, and our seniors need to know that and understand that, um, and be able to understand that going into your senior year as you get ready for it. So. Uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jake, who's going to talk a little bit more directly to the athletes on um, a couple of their next steps. But uh, again, come on up here, Jake. Um, oh, that's a great picture. <laughs> um, so enjoy that. But thank you again for everybody. I'll come back up at the end. We'll talk to a couple questions. But I'll hand it over to Jake and let him take off. You know how they say uh, nervousness is the same as excitement? I don't, I don't know if I believe in that. It's just nervous. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the recruiting process, whereas Coach Peter talked about it more so from that parent perspective, but I'm going to look at it from the athlete perspective. It, I went through this somewhat recently, about uh, nine, nine. Nine is not that recent. Nine, eight years ago. Um, but anyway, so feel free. If there's any questions, raise your hand, of course. Let me know. Um, we're going to top or touch on some topics. We're going to want to know ourselves, what factors are important to us, and what factors that I'm putting out there externally for the coaches and the schools that are recruiting me. Um, we're going to talk about what actions you have to take. In other words, you know, take initiative, what you have to do. 
And then know when and how to break up with the school. I know for a lot of our older kids that are going through this process right now, one of their biggest questions and when they get the most nervous is, how do I tell a school no? Um, so we'll cover, we'll cover a little bit of that. Okay, know yourself. First, we're gonna talk about non-swimming stats or statistics, um, and that applies academic, um, in addition to, sorry, I lost my place. Oh, what we're looking for in the factors in our school, right? So number one, what am I doing academically in high school that's gonna prepare me and open up different doors for me in college? So we gotta know our GPAs, both weighted and unweighted, how we're setting ourselves up freshman, sophomore year, right? Coach Peter talked on, um, talked on it before. We wanna maintain at least a 325. That really should be a goal for us. If we can shoot for higher, that's better, and that's gonna open up more opportunities for you. Test score is the same thing. You guys are probably either have or about to take PSATs. That's a good benchmark for us to prepare for the SATs. What can we do to prepare between sophomore and junior year to perform better on our SATs and our ACTs? Those play a huge factor, just as GPA does um, in the college, de the college decision and who's interested in you. Um, a college will look at what you're doing academically, both in classroom and test scores, and that's gonna be a good um, factor for them to be able to, to see how much they can trust you to handle the course load that you will in college, right? It, it shows that you're accountable, you can hold yourself together in the classroom, you're not gonna be an issue for them when you get to the team. Um, other things, physicality, right? Like we, most of us have either gone through our growth spurt already or we're about to hit it. We gotta know what are we offering and what does the college coach see in us? It's a, it's a blunt reality of our sport that physical attributes are important, right? College coaches are generally gonna be looking not necessarily just for height, but length, right? Wingspan, super important. Um, weight distribution, which often contributes to how you race, how you float in the water. So those are things we gotta pay attention to. And obviously there's factors that we can contribute to to help ourselves in that. And it starts just with being consistent at our practices and, and doing dry land well and, and preparing yourself that way. Um, of course, potential majors start thinking about what you're interested in. I think most of us adults here would say that it, you don't really know what you want to study when you're your age, um, but it's good to keep an idea of, of what you'd be interested in to then be able to apply that to the different schools that you're looking at to make sure that they have courses and programs that would kind of fit into your general interest. And then of course, location preferences. Um, I lived in the north, I would never go back. Um, I liked it where it was warm, and so for me it was, um, when I was making my, my college choice, it was important to me to find um, I, I looked on the East Coast and I looked South, right? I ended up in Texas, so not necessarily East Coast, but I did end up somewhere warm. Um, we'll move on to parent conversations. Um, parents and, and student athletes of parents, you know, sons and daughters, let's have open conversations. And, and really, I think this falls more so on the parents to be open and to facilitate these open conversations. Be honest with your children about what um, financial options are realistic for your families. Um, and then, of course, personal requirements, right? In addition to the location, is religion something that's important to you? Do you want to go to a school that supports that religion or has a large community of the similar sect? Um, so those are things that you need to pay attention to. And of course, academics. Are we looking for a rigorous academic program? Are we looking for a larger state school that has a wider array of programs? These are all factors that should be discussed between uh, swimmer and parent. And then lastly, swimming stats and info. I mean, this is, this is the world that we live in. Um, we all know about this. We gotta know our best times, our best events. College coaches aren't just interested in your best event, right? They wanna see some diversity in what you're able to swim. Um, you could put it this way. I, I had this conversation recently. As a, as a sophomore in high school, you wanna have a pretty wide range of ability that can then be narrowed down as you get to college, right? Because in college, um, most conference meets will be spread out over four, three days. And ideally, you would swim about one event per day. So you have to have some diversity in what you're able to swim. If you're just a miler, right, the, the school doesn't want to take you to the conference championship so that you can sit there for three days, not do anything, and, and swim the mile on the last day. You need to be able to do a 5 free, a 4 a.m., or a 200 backstroke, something like that. So um, be OK with swimming lots of events. You never know what you might drop lots of time in and, and what might serve you an opportunity to, to be decent at in college. Um, other things to, to pay attention to. What meets are you going to? What will give you exposure to the college coaches that you're interested in speaking with? Um, most of the larger meets as you go up, futures, junior nationals, national championships, you'll see more and more uh, college coaches at, that, at those meets and they'd be interested in seeing you. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go to those meets to be recruited. 
Um, there's a, a cool tool called Swim Cloud that I'm sure most of you know about, um, and that shows all your times. And really, that's the basis of what coaches will will use to find you and your times. But they would love to see you in person. They like to see how you compete, how you act in and out of the water, things like that. Um, the other direction of that is you have to think about what kind of coaching styles you like. What what environment and what un, under what coaching styles do you perform your best? So I think a lot of you have been exposed to different coaching styles, right? There's the, the pretty hardcore coaching style. There's more laid back. Um, there's environments, maybe team environments that you want to think about. Is it important to you to have a really large team, everyone invest in the goals? Or do you feel like you're a pretty independent person and maybe if part of the team was more focused on academics and, and that's, didn't you know, spend the summer's training there or something like that, would you be okay with that? These are things that you need to pay attention to so that when you have those conversations with the coaches and then eventually on our visits with the team themselves that you kind of weigh how you feel interacting with those people versus what you think your preferences are. Um, so I think that's about it. There's just some small factors, right? Like, do you like swimming outdoors? We're spoiled here in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we had Landon Kaiser, I use his example, he, he signed with Wisconsin, he's from South Florida, and that was a concern for him. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to make that adjustment to indoor swimming in the north, which is a real concern, right? But he found that the other factors outweighed that, and he's excited for that option. So just think about what those little details are that actually might be pretty important to you. All right. So. Uh, selecting our colleges. I think this is a, a little bit of an intimidating phase or process for a lot of us. It's trying to figure out of, of the thousands of, of college opportunities that are out there, how do I even begin to find the ones that might make sense for me? Um, Coach Peter mentioned it, right? We know the big names just because they're on TV on Saturday, right? We know the Floridas, the Georgias, but there's so many other options out there that might be better fits for us that it's important that we try to find those options and that can be a daunting process. So how we'll do it it's so what we call the 2010-5 process. Um, it's essentially nailing down what schools we'd be interested in, starting with a list of 20 interesting schools that might check a few boxes that we think would be important to us. Um, within those first 20 schools, we go by like a 5-10-5 rule, meaning there's five dream schools, right? So these might feel like a stretch, either athletically or academically or both. Um, in the middle would be 10 solid choices that we feel like there's a good chance that we could get in there. We could contribute to the team. We might, might not be the best swimmer on the team, but we're not going to be the worst, right? We would fit into the swim team, and we could see ourselves developing there. And then five safety schools. And I don't want those safety schools to feel like those are drop-off schools, right? Like, that, that's the last resort. It's nothing like that. These are schools that we're very confident that we could contribute athletically at, and we're confident that we could get in academically. Um, and, and those are the, the main factors we need to consider in addition to, you know, location, academic majors, things like that. If you can start at this phase, once you start to narrow down about 20 schools, I would, I would, if possible, you either visit those schools unofficially, and I'll dive into what the difference between an official and unofficial visit is. But if you and your family can make a day trip to those schools, check it out, get a feel for campus, that's great. And now, I mean, it's, it's awesome what's available online. If you look up any school or any team's Instagram page, you could get a really good feel of how that team interacts. You can get to see them swim on their Instagram pages. In addition to just the school page themselves, they'll post the pretty pictures around campus so you'll get an idea. So um, I left my phone down there, but it's all good. I want us to run through an exercise here quick. If you don't mind, swimmers and parents, pull out our phone really quick if you have one. And what we're going to do is run through a swim cloud practice, which I'm sure you guys have spent a lot of time on, but we're going to kind of go through it um, from the perspective of trying to find these 20 schools. So. Um, once you go to, if everyone would Google Swim Cloud, get to swimcloud.com, and I'll give a, a second so we could get there. And just like a quick show of hands if, we're, if we've made it. Okay, awesome. All right, so there's obviously a lot of different options for schools. D1, right? There's the D1 Power 5 schools. Those are SEC, ACC, Pac-12, Big Ten. Those are the big, the football schools that we think of. Um, an example of that school would be where Drew Heck signed today is, is Pittsburgh. Um, so we'll use that as an example, but this exercise could apply for, for any of the schools that might have, we have either researched and found interest in, or maybe they've reached out to us and, we're, and are interested in us. But let's start with this. In the search bar up top of Swim Cloud, we're going to just type in Pitt, P-I-T-T. -T. The first school that shows up should be University of Pittsburgh. We're going to click on that. And I'll just use eye contact with me as the cue. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do 
you'll scroll down a little bit, just, there's like a header picture of their pool. It says pit, and then it says D1 ACC, and then just below that, there should be like a little scroll bar that lists, I believe, I don't, and I don't know in what order, but, but team or roster, times, um, conference, things like that. I want you to click the times one. It, should, it just says times. And then we'll get to a page where it, I think it'll probably start with, it'll say 2022-23 men's 50 freestyle is my guess is what it says. Right side, okay. So from here, we can start to see what the top times per season are for this school, right? It's really important. Yeah, I was pretty close. Okay, so we can filter those right here, the filter button, if you wanna choose that. You don't have to right away, but you guys get the gist of what I'm doing. If I'm a backstroker, if I'm a female backstroker, I could click women, right? And then I'll go down, I'll scroll down or filter through to the 100 backstroke. What I'm looking for is do I fit probably within, and coaches jump in, maybe third to sixth on that list, right? Would make sense for me to be a contributing member of that team. Maybe I'm not the best, number one, right? I'm not their best backstroker, but I could be competitive, hopefully for a spot on maybe a B or C relay. I might be um, welcome to their conference meet if I kind of fit into that conference championship scoring range. But anyway, I'm on their depth chart, right? If I fall outside of that top six to, to seven range, I'm probably not in their recruitable times yet. Um, maybe they'd consider me for a walk-on, but it's also important to apply that exercise to other events, right? What are my top three events? And then you could apply that exercise for um, the different events per team. Um, briefly, I want you to try to go back. Actually, we don't even have to go back. If you just scroll up to the top of the page, so you still have that header picture, and this is University of Pittsburgh. Right below that, it'll say Division I and then ACC. I want you guys to click on ACC. So the ACC is the conference that Pitt is in. Again, this exercise could be applied to any school. What I like to use this feature for is oftentimes we have one school name that reaches out to us. And, and another example um, was Drew Bowen recently at LaSalle University. And we needed to learn a little bit more about what other schools similar to LaSalle might be an option for him. So the great way to do that is you go check out the conference that the school is in. And now we're on that ACC page the third option, it says home meets and then teams. If you click teams, it's going to list the rankings of all the teams in that conference. Okay. So if I think that I'm a recruitable student athlete or I'm interested in Pitt, it'd be important to check out the schools that Pitt competes against, right? Because there's potentially a good chance that I would be recruitable to some of those schools. Maybe not all of them, right? There's a big difference in looking at this list. Pitt, Pitt for, the, for the women were ranked 11th in the conference, whereas a UVA was ranked number one. I think a lot of us know just UVA swimming is, is really, really competitive. But if we start to look at the schools around Pitt, you got Georgia Tech, we got Miami, Florida State, like some of those schools might be an option. Again, you could do this for any school. LaSalle was in the A-10, I believe. We went and looked at the A-10 list and we found a bunch of other schools that might be options for him. So I hope everyone understood that exercise, but it's really easy to use this tool to kind of figure out different options to start to narrow down your list of 20. You could start to get an idea of schools that are in a similar bubble, similar range for you to consider. All right, we're going to move down to the 10. So we're starting to narrow it down. So after you've done some research, it's time to try to narrow that list down. This might come towards the middle or end of sophomore year once you have an idea and you've done enough research to feel like you have a, an inkling as to, as to what you might be interested in. Um, once you get down to about 10 schools, that's when you start really diving into their schools and trying to make effort to reach out to them and make contact. So every school's swim website, if you go to Athletics NC State, for instance, and you go to the swim page on the Athletics page at NC State, there's going to be a, a bar at the top of their website that says questionnaire. You click questionnaire and you fill it out. It's going to be your name, top times, where you're from. It'll give you an open, you know, open log where you can type some notes, just some things like that. You click submit. What will happen is the coach on the receiving end will get an email, says, hey, this person has filled out your questionnaire. And then they know that you're interested in them. And if they're interested in what you've provided as information, especially if they don't know you already, then that's a, either they'll put you in their database of people to reach out to when they can, or they'll reach out right away if you're at that correct age. Um, let's see, so when you look at this list of top 10, once you've filled out questionnaires, you've expressed your interest in those schools, um, you, you definitely got to dive into, okay, do these, are these schools realistic? So hopefully the top 20 list has got you thinking about, do these schools make sense for me? When you dive into that top 10, you know, if we can't, if we're not at a level where we can swim at the University of Georgia, 
which is a really high level performing team, maybe that shouldn't be in our top 10, right? It's just not realistic for us athletically. Um, so it's important that you and your parents check out this list, feel confident that these schools make sense for you. Um, and then once their coaches are able to respond to you, so beginning in that contact period, if they just express interest, let's make sure that we're active in that, in that conversation, right? If you get an email, answer back. It doesn't have to be anything in depth or long. Um, just make sure that they know that you exist, right? And that you're interested in them. And so that when you can set up phone conversations and things like that, there's been a little bit of relationship building via email, things like that. Um, lastly, in, in that group of 10, back to the academic side of things, we got to make sure that those schools fit what we're looking for potentially academically. The bigger the school, potentially more options there are, different pathways you could take. If you're looking at a little bit smaller schools, smaller enrollments, they might have less academic programs or major options. We just got to make sure if they're in your list, they at least fit something that you're interested in or potentially you could see yourself fitting into one of those majors. All right, so lastly, we'll bump it down to five. So this is where the recruiting process really starts to feel serious. These are your, your legitimate options, the ones that hopefully you'll, you'll end up weighing against each other and will, in your, your ultimate choice will be in this group of five. Um, these are the places where you and your parents decide, you know, number one, we could probably afford this. Number two, it fits what I'm looking for athletically and academically. I feel like I know the coach well, uh, have a relationship with them that's been developed through phone calls, potentially visits eventually. Um, and, and as the last point says here, once you get down to these five, these five schools, three to five schools, coaches, if they're continue to be interested in you, will hopefully offer those official visits and then you'll get to go see campus, hang out with the team, stay with the team overnight, um, and you should get a really, really good idea. And at that point, once you start having those official visits, that's really the point where coaches will start to ask, okay, is, are we your choice? And you just have to have those di discussions and conversations with your parents. All right. So moving on to what I alluded to, those are recruiting visits. Uh, there's two different types of visits. There's official visits and unofficial visits. And, and I'll put the, the slides up there just so we can weigh those against each other. Unofficial visits can take place at any time. You could take those right now. You could take those as freshmen. Um, what the unofficial visit means is that the school isn't paying for any part of the visit. Okay, so they're not there to, to pay for your food, for your, wherever you're living or wherever you're staying. That's up to you and your family to go visit campus to check it out on your own. Um, depending on age, if you're able to contact a coach, you can meet with them on campus. You can have a conversation there with, with them and your parents. Um, but again, you, they are not paying for any part of your visit, and you could take as many of these as you would like. So if you and your parents want to go up and down the East Coast visiting schools and, and you talk to a bunch of coaches while you're there, none of those count against your official visits. Official visits, on the other hand, are generally reserved for those schools that are on the end of your list and you're on the end of their list, right? They want you, potentially, and you want to you weigh them against your main options. You're limited to five total official visits in your recruiting process. Okay, official visits begin August 1st uh, prior to junior year, correct? So prior to your junior year, August 1st, you could start taking those official visits. And as Coach Peter went through with that recruiting timeline, decision timeline, you can see a lot of student athletes start making their decisions in the fall of junior year. That's because they've loaded up that, that end of summer, early fall with their official visits. They've met with the coaches, they've met with the team, they've stayed there potentially a whole long weekend, they've gone to a football game, They've gotten a taste of what it's like to be a student athlete at that school. They have the information necessary to start to make a decision. And then you start to see those decisions being made in early fall. Um, on an official visit, what it'll lo usually look like, oftentimes, especially if they're taking place in the fall, the school will invite you during a football weekend. There's a lot of activity on campus. Um, they'll, they'll pay for your travel out there generally, whether if it's far away, they might pay, pay for your plane ticket. If it's a closer, they might ask that you drive there or they'll pay gas money for you to get there. But once you're on campus, they'll arrange for your, for your lodging and your meals. You might stay with other student athletes in the dorms with them. Um, I was a host when I was in college. I was a host to recruits, I don't know, five, five times a year. So I probably hosted close to 20 um, recruits throughout my time in college. And that's just what you do. Once you're on the team, it's, then you're a part of that recruiting process. But as a host, I'm going to show the recruit what life is like. So I might bring them to class with me. They might sit through a couple classes. Not the most exciting part of the trip, but still a good way to, to understand what life on campus is like. We'll take them out to dinner. We might go to um, a merchandise shop, let them shop around for some stuff. We'll go to a football game, stand on the sideline for warm-ups, really cool experience, take pictures, stuff like that. And we'll see them through that weekend. And, then, and you know, whatever we do at night after the football game, whether it's go out to eat, things like that, they'll hang with the team so you get a really good taste of what, um, what it feels like to be a student athlete there. 
parents on visits. Um, if you go on an unofficial visit, as I explained, you'll probably be with your parents, and then you guys just do whatever you're scheduled to do. On an official visit, parents are allowed. Um, it's not super common for parents to go on the official visits, but it does happen. But even if you do, the student athlete and the parent will probably be on a separate schedule. So at, there will be points where they're together and they're meeting potentially with the coaches together, or the parents get to interact with the, the current team but there's definitely going to be times when the, the student athlete splits off from the parents and they're going to do their own thing and parents might have to you know, keep themselves busy. All right, checklist for the process. And, and Coach Claire, I'm going to kind of have you just kind of open these all up and I'll just kind of go down one by one. There's a lot here, um, but it, think about it as a funnel, right? Just like the 2010-5 process, we got to funnel our decision down by going through these steps. So number one, Collect all your personal data. What do you need? Times, physicality, what are you looking for in terms of academics, athletics? Know yourself, know what you're looking for. Parents, you gotta be honest with your kids what you want them to be looking for. Be open to hearing what they're looking for. Potentially it doesn't match up exactly with what you had in mind, that's okay. Um, let them know what makes sense for you guys financially, where you'd like to see them as a family, whether it be close by in location. I know we have a family right now um, who the parents live in the UK and, and and the, the student athlete just told me they're looking at Hawaii. So <laughs> the, the parents have to be okay with that. It's important to, to have those conversations. Um, as Coach Peter mentioned, parents talk to the club coach. We, I'm sure we could have some insight. We're not going to make a decision for anybody. We're not going to tell you exactly where to look, but we'll definitely be a guiding um, force in that. And we'll, we'll have those conversations with the student athlete. Maybe you have some opinions that you, you would like to share with the student athlete and they're not being well received. We're open to hearing those. We won't, no, we won't necessarily agree with you all the time, but we'll, we'll have those conversations. Um, register for the Eligibility Center January 1, sophomore year. Make sure you're ready to go. It's a really easy process to just make sure that you're a recruitable student athlete. The NCAA is aware of your, your being, and then coaches are aware of you as well, and they're able to, to reach out when the time comes. We talked about Swim Cloud. Keep those updated with times. Most meets we go to, those times will be updated automatically, but it's, it's good to just make sure that you're checking in. You know, a lot of us, I, I even did it when I was a student athlete. I checked in probably too much, paid too much attention to what my ranking was or my, my power ranking. Just make sure that that's updated. That's how college coaches organize their lists when they're recruiting. Big list, get your 20 schools, fill out those questionnaires, start to narrow it down, get down to your, to your final five, talk to the coaches, let them know you're very, very interested in their school. Um, and then hopefully you could schedule some official visits. Um, the breakup piece. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. I mentioned it earlier. The breakup is, a, is seemingly difficult, but I will lead with this, and this is what I say to every student athlete who says that they're scared to do it. Every coach recruits probably, they start with a list of 100 to 200 student athletes per year, right? They're going to take 8 to 10. So that means 190 kids either they had to say no to or said no to them, and they do this every year. So you breaking up with them is nothing new. They've been through it before. It's their job. They're not going to be emotional about it, right? If you've developed a relationship, there might be a connection there, and you have to be cordial and, about it and, and let them know you've really appreciated the process. But you saying, hey, I, you know, I got to look a different direction, they might ask why, and, and you could be honest if you choose, or you could just keep it really, you know, really vague. It's like, I, I, you know, me and my family have decided it's not the best option for me. We have some other options open, so I'm going to pursue those. Ultimately, you know, they might be a little bit disappointed, but it's, it's not, the emotion involved is not the same as a, as a, as a relationship, right? It's not going to feel, feel like that heartbreak. They'll move on, you'll move on, everything will be all right. So that can be done ideally via a phone call. I know that's a little scary for a lot of us, but again, they've been through it before, so it's much more nerve-wracking for us as a student athlete than it is the coach. They've heard it a million times. All right. Moving on to the checklist for each school. These are just some things to keep in mind. Once we have our smaller list, maybe the 10 to 5 list, these are things that we want to make sure that we do for each of the schools so that we feel well informed about where we stand with those, those schools. Um, I had mentioned earlier, use social media and YouTube for things like this. Research it. Get a feel for the school so that Ideally, if you were to walk onto that school for an official visit, you would be able to point out different landmarks or, or recognize certain things that you've already seen. You don't want something to feel super foreign if it's on your narrow list, right? We want to feel like we have an idea of what the coach is like, what the team is like, what the facilities look like. These are all things that are easily accessible nowadays that we should take advantage of. Um, know what 
options you have available for academics and majors, we should have a list. It's, again, easily accessible online. Know what potential options you might choose. The coach might ask you that. Um, so I would have a good answer for them. I was in high school. I thought I was going to study biology. I ended up in political science. So uh, obviously those things can change, but it still helps the, the coaches tell you where to look and, and what, what programs to check out or even like what buildings to, to visit where you might be spending your time in classes. Um, contact information is a little bit out of order, but like the the contact information of coaches, once you start that contact process, again, easily accessible on team websites. If I look up pit swimming coaches, the first link will bring you to a, a page that lists all the different coaches. It'll list head coaches, assistant coaches, their name, their emails will be right there. It'd be a great exercise just to go through your 10 to 20 schools, visit each of the websites, put their, the coach's name and their email in an Excel spreadsheet just so you have those easily accessible. Um, Setting up those contact times, don't be afraid to reach out. If you're reaching out early before the contact period, luckily the coaches can still say, hey, it's a little bit early for us to talk. I look forward to connecting with you later. So don't feel like you need to be super cautious and, and reserved. Put yourself out there, and then they'll make sure that they guide the process. It's better to, for them to know that you're interested. Um, we talked about it earlier. Any emails, text, phone calls that you get, try to respond to those within 24 hours to, to let them know that you're interested and, and want to be involved in those conversations. Um, a lot of us, it's easy to put stuff like that off, but we can send a text super, super quick, and, and that lets them know that, that you're still willing to talk to them. Um, ideally, if you can schedule Zooms with the coaches before you take those official visits, that FaceTime is valuable. Invite the one of the student athletes potentially join the coach on a zoom i did that as a student athlete it would be the coach and then me as a current student athlete talking to the recruit just so it doesn't feel super formal just between recruit and coach you kind of have the student athlete to, to bounce some questions off and lighten things up and then of course schedule those official visits and then um, one key thing here it's super super easy a lot of us skip over it and even in our professional life we do this a thank you note or a handwritten note goes a long, long way. So if you are invited on an official visit and they treat you well, you know, mail them a handwritten thank you note and they'll remember that, I promise. So I think that's it for me and I'm gonna invite Coach Alexis up here for the good fit. All right, I'm gonna talk about the different types of schools that are available out there um, and what athletes might fit in each school. So we're gonna kinda, if you don't know who this is, this is Kenzie, she won the mile and the 500 at NCAs. She's a late night athlete, so that's pretty cool. Went to Alabama. All right, so we're gonna start with Division One. Okay, um, Division One Power Five. So this is the Power Five conferences and this is what's commonly known as the Power Five conferences. Big 10, Big 12, Pac-10, SEC, and ACC. They're called the Power Five because they have the most power monetarily in terms of their ability to provide for things. They are also held to a much higher standard than the mid-major schools are on a regular basis when it comes to recruiting rules. So they're gonna be pretty much holding you accountable for every single time that they talk to you. Um, I gave a couple examples up there. Again, if you use the tool that Coach Jake gave you, which is go to Swim Cloud, look at those conferences, you'll be able to see what schools might be similar to those. Um, each school has 14 female scholarships and nine male scholarships. Coach Peter alluded to kind of the complexity of scholarships and combining scholarships and how that works. Uh, if you most schools, especially at this level, are going to be fully funded, which means they have 14 scholarships and nine scholarships. It means that if you get a partial scholarship, you are not going to be able to combine it with an academic scholarship. So you need to be aware of that. You have to take one or the other. Um, the academic requirements for the Power Five are going to be a little bit higher uh, than maybe Division II or NAIA, but they are going to be kind of a little bit lower than maybe some of the mid-major schools. You're gonna see a lot more swag, you're gonna see a lot more support. Anything at these schools that a football team or a basketball team gets has to be given to every single athlete on campus, which is the really cool thing. So if you're a swimmer at a Power Five conference, and Coach Peter, Jake, and I all were in Power Five conferences, we got all the same stuff that the football team got, which was really awesome. You got to go get shoes, you got to get sweats, you got to get t-shirts, you got to get all the swag. And if you've ever watched like a, uh, you go onto Instagram and you follow some of the athletes, they'll do like a reel where they show you all the stuff they get. It's a lot. And it's gotten even more since I, like way more since I graduated, but that's a different story. Um, 
So these are going to be larger schools, again, with more degree options. Most of the Power Five schools are going to be over 20 to 30,000 students. Um, being an athlete at one of these schools is going to be a pretty big deal in the campus, and you're going to have a lot of support from the, the athletes and the coaches and the administration at a lot of these schools, a lot more so than you would at some of the other schools. So that's a nice perk. Um, one of the things that I always liked is my athlete that went to Nebraska, she always said that every time she went into a, like a restaurant wearing her Nebraska swag, she would get free food. Like it was just something that just happened because athletes were the king in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, types of swimmers here, at a minimum, they have to have a 2.5 GPA and a 24 plus ACT. Now that's going to change depending on how fast you are. That's if you're an Olympic trial qualifier, okay? If you are not an Olympic trial qualifier, you've got to have a higher GPA and a higher ACT score and a higher test score. Okay, so you need to kind of plan for that. That's going to scale up as you go. Most schools are going to be looking at that 3.25, and they're going to be looking at a 27 on that ACT, which is going to be equivalent to averaging 650 to 700 on your SAT scores. So kind of think in that kind of, those kind of terms if you're taking the SAT. Uh, power five, again, they're going to be looking for summer juniors. At most power fives, they're going to be expecting summer juniors for you to walk on. Okay, so that's one of those things. If you're like, I want to go to Georgia, I want to go to Texas, I want to go somewhere like that, great. You've got to have summer juniors to walk on, maybe. And that is a big maybe. And it's not to, like, intimidate you. Again, if you look at the ACC list that Coach Jake pulled up, Pitt kind of pulls a little bit slower down. Uh, they they kind of have that winner junior level ability to help you out. Um, Boston College is the same way. Those are places where they might have a little bit more flexibility in terms of what they're allowing. But... The reality is they're expecting, even at those schools, like they're expecting summer juniors to walk on to the program. If you're looking for money, you're probably going to need to have Olympic trials and probably be in a position where you are going to be finaling at Olympic trials. They're going to be looking for athletes that can final and score at their conference championship meets. So if you want to see what that's going to look like, pull up an SEC finals. 24th at SECs is summer juniors plus Olympic trials plus it's real fast okay like pull it up in your event look at those results see what you've got um, again like coach Peter mentioned full scholarships do not exist um, anymore they did a long time ago they do not anymore okay so you need if you're planning on going to this power five conference you are not going to be getting a full ride um, so make sure that you're having those financial conversations with your parents personality wise these coaches um, are going to be looking for athletes that are very dedicated to the craft of swimming. It's not just going to be about, I like swimming a lot. It's really fun. It's, I'm dedicated to how I'm doing this. Uh, you're going to cultivate your academic schedule around your swimming. You're going to cultivate it around your recovery. You're going to cultivate it around your sleep, your food, your training table. Everything is going to be focused on swimming as the focus point of your existence as well as academics. So you are also expected to graduate as a swimmer in four years. Football players and basketball players, they can kind of get that five or six years sometime. Even at a place like Northwestern, we had a guy that went six years. But like, you've got to have the understanding that you're going to graduate in four years. That means you're going to probably have to take summer school. You're going to probably have to make sure that you're taking a little bit more rigorous load in those times when you're not going to classes, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, these programs, the really great thing about this is the incredibly strong alumni involvement. Again, Coach Peter, Coach Jake, and I can all speak to how much we're involved as alumni with our particular schools and we, how much we care about that. One of the fun things that one of my coaches said to me during when I was going through the process was, what do you want to wear as an alumni? Okay, what, what logo do you want to wear as an alumni when you graduate? You know, And it, for me, it came down to Texas and Northwestern, and I didn't want to wear poop brown. So I picked purple. So <laughs> horns down. Um, anyway, uh, so that's kind of the power five. So if you really want to go there, you've got to do that. And most of these schools are also going to be finishing up their recruiting by August of, like, the, most of them are done with their junior classes already. So if you're a junior and you want to go to one of these schools, especially on the top end of those conferences, they're already done. So you've got to kind of move forward and try something else and look at maybe a lower end of the conference or something along those lines. The number of times I talk with the coaches at these schools and I'm like, oh, what are you looking for? Like, oh, well, we're now working on our sophomore class. They're already on that. They're looking already. So that's where they're at right now. However, if you want to swim D1, 
there are still a lot of places to go, which brings us to the mid-majors. Okay, this is where Coach Claire went. Coach Claire went to a mid-major at Northern Colorado. And this has a lot more opportunities and availabilities for athletes to go, and it's a much wider spectrum of schools. At Division I, they are still required to maintain that four-year graduation rate. So your athlete's still going to have that support, and you as a student are going to be expected to graduate in four years. doesn't matter that it's not a Power Five. They want you to graduate. They also still have to provide you with all the academic support that a Power Five does. So that means all these Division I schools are going to have that academic support that you need. They're also going to have all the swag. Same rules apply. If you go to a place that's got a really good basketball program, uh, they're going to have a whole bunch of swag. And they might not have a football team, but that basketball team's got all kinds of stuff. Guess what? So do all the swimmers. And it's a ton of really cool stuff. Um, so one of the things I always like to ask when you're looking at a school is, what's their sponsor? Are they sponsored by Under Armour? Are they sponsored by Adidas? Are they sponsored by Tier? If you're sponsored by Tier, they're probably sponsored by Under Armour. That's always a good thing to know. Just a pro tip. Um, Again, GPAs, same things here. They're still looking for that 2.524 ACT minimum, but most of them are going to be looking at that higher end. And these are unweighted GPAs. These aren't weighted GPAs. When you're being recruited, you need to know both, unweighted and weighted. Those are very important when you're talking about admission. Um, Power 5, again, they're going to be looking, uh, again, for these, they're going to be looking more, a little bit broader. Summer juniors qualifiers, you're probably going to get money. Kind of a little, the, kind of looking at a little bit more of a funding there. If you are a f winter juniors qualifier, some of these schools you're going to be able to get money. And then if you've got futures, even some of these schools will still have money available for you or have that walk on. So futures is that like threshold for some of these colleges. And again, if you need help kind of figuring out what those are, that's kind of something we can help you with. Um, athletes here are going to be very driven. There's going to be a more even distribution between academics and athletics at this level. These students are going to be, these athletes, these college coaches, they're going to care more about your graduation and your academics. There's going to be a little more flexibility. You're going to see coaches that are like, oh, yeah, you can come in and swim a little earlier today because you've got lab on Tuesday and I'll be here for you. Like, they're going to, you're going to see a little bit more of that flexibility. This is a great place if you're looking for something to commit to long course and short course. There's a variability. There's some D1 schools in this level that don't do a whole lot in the summer. But for the most part, they're going to have some expectations of you training throughout the calendar year. So there, if you're looking for something like that, that's going to hold you accountable for those long course goals. Again, they're going to have people that qualify for NCAAs. They're going to have people that qualify for Olympic trials. They're going to have people that qualify for the Olympics. There, those, all these things exist at the Division I level, and you just have to find that school that might find that perfect coaching match for you. Again, they still have that 14 and 9.9. .9, but they generally are not going to be fully funded, which means there is some flexibility to have that academic and athletic combination. So that's something to keep in mind. Most of these schools are not going to be fully funded, which means they don't have somebody that's paying for all 14 scholarships that are specifically athletic. So you can kind of combine an academic scholarship and go there. So these are good options if you want kind of like an academic program that has that. All right, next is Division Two. Division two is, we've got a lot of these in Florida. When I was recruiting from outside the state, I, I had a lot of kids that looked at schools here. Um, for whatever reason, there's just a ton of division two schools in Florida and they're really good. Uh, these are gonna have, still have your academic support. Division two schools are still required to have that. Uh, they have a larger allowed travel size. So for division one, power five, and division one mid-major, there are very strict travel size limits to go to like your dual meets. Okay, so when you're in a Power Five conference, usually your travel size, your travel roster is limited to between 18 to 22 athletes. When you're at a mid-major, it's usually 20 to 24 athletes per gender. When you're at a Division II school, it's more like 24 to 28 athletes. So almost everybody on that team and that roster is going to be traveling. Um, that means if you're like, let's say we're going to, we're... Um, Tampa and we're going to go swim Florida Southern, I get to bring my whole roster there. Whereas if I'm Georgia and I'm going to go swim Texas, I'm only bringing 18 athletes. So a lot of kids don't get to go and have a lot of that competitive experience. Um, next, you've got just this longer flexibility of enrollment. So these schools aren't going to necessarily have that hardwire. You have to have your application in by now. I see a lot of athletes that maybe have gone through that set of five and then they can kind of move it into a later phase. Um, the other cool part about Division Two is if you're a distance swimmer, they have the 1,000 and they have the 100 IM. 
The other cool part about Division Two is at conference championships, you can swim four events rather than just three. You can swim four relays. You can also do a combination of three, relay, three individual events and five relays. So they have a little bit more of a flexible event. Their, conference, their championship is a combined championship. It's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, I've been a bunch of times. It's really rowdy and loud. Queens used to dominate it. Coach Peter can tell you that the, those meets are insane. Um, the academics here are a little bit lower. There's a little bit lower starting bar on academics. So if you're someone who has a little trouble with academics, this is a good place to start. Or if you're not particularly good at test score, test, this is a division two is a great place to go if you're not super good at tests. Um, again, winter juniors and above, you can maybe get a little bit of money. Futures, you're going to be able to walk on. Sectionals, you can usually walk on to most uh, Division II programs if you've got the sectional level times. Again, you're going to have older athletes. There's going to be a lot of foreign athletes at this level. And you're going to have a little bit longer time for degree completion. Usually they allow for a five-year degree completion, which is nice. Um, and don't think it's slow. Like making NCAA, finaling in the mile, being an All-American in the mile, top eight, was la two years ago. It's the only reason I know my, my athlete was eighth. And he was 15... 24 in the mile so it's not slow okay division two is still a pretty quick division and division three um, this is going to be no scholarships because this is a very academic level division okay if you are looking for really good academics whether it's liberal arts tech um, if you're looking for engineering if you're looking for pre-med this is where you see the johns hopkins the grinnells the mit's denison kenyon nyu Carnegie Mellon. These are like the really, really high-end academics. That's going to be the priority. Um, you still see athletes make Olympic trials. You still see people make the Olympic team. We, this last year, a young man, a graduate from Emory made the Olympic team this last time. Andrew something. Andrew Wilson in the 200 breaststroke. Um, and again, this is going to range from senior nationals all the way down to state qualifiers. It may not be on the same team. Like to be at Emory, you might need to be more along the lines of a futures qualifier or a winter juniors qualifier to make it. But there's going to be a place like Grinnell where you can be more like a sectionals qualifier. But to get into Grinnell, which is a small school in Iowa, you actually have to have like a almost a perfect GPA and almost a perfect SAT score. Their admissions rate is so higher than is lower than Harvard's. So it's one of those things where like there's schools like that where swimming can help you get in to these high-end programs. There's a lot of programs, 350 women's programs, 300 men's programs. Um, and sometimes because they're private institutions, they can get financial help for you that maybe isn't available to other people. Uh, the academics, again, really strong. It's going to be slower. These are programs that are not going to be like, hey, let's get in. Let's get you in right away. Let's get you signed. Let's get you committed. They're usually going to be waiting for that regular admissions process. They're going to expect you to have all your I's, cross, I's dotted and T's crossed and that kind of thing. Uh, academics are going to be first. You're going to have study abroad options. Probably about half the team is going to be people that like swimming and they do it year round. The other half is going to be we do it during season and then while we're at school, but then in the summer we're doing an internship and that's okay too. Um, but again, go and look at the Division Three. Look at Use that swim cloud, go and look at their conference and see what they've got. Um, next up is NAIA. This one I'm going to kind of go through real quick. Um, there aren't, this is a really small conference. Uh, this is a conference where if you have athletes that have learning uh, that are on an IEP or on a 503, these are schools that really specialize in helping athletes get through their graduation program. Plus, they focus on making sure that you graduate and have a job right away. This is the focus. This is an older conference. You're going to see people that are 28, 29, 30. There was a really cool story about a baseball player who was in his 30s that started playing in NAIA and then went and played mid-majors. So it's never too late. Um, but it's a really cool op option for athletes that maybe need a little bit more time to graduate. It's a little bit more fluid. It does not fall under the NCAA guidelines. So they're recruiting process is a little different. Um, athletes I've had that gone there have become nurses, doctors, that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, it's, it's just a different way to go through your education process. And their national championship, their time standards are right around like low end, like sectional times, maybe a little bit above sectional times. So um, that's a good place if you're kind of wanting to kind of burst in. But to win, you're probably going to need to be around juniors. All right, next is club swimming. This is an option a lot of our athletes take here. A lot of colleges have this. It now has its own national championship. It's in Atlanta, or at least this last year was at Ohio State. Um, 
Everybody kind of comes to the table because they want to be there. They want to compete. They want to keep their career going. Almost every school now has these, especially if you want to go to like one of those power fives. And if you want to wear those logos and you want to have those caps, they have all that. They're allowed to do that. It's licensed. It's really cool. A lot of them have coaches. Like we were talking in the office today, Colorado Boulder um, offers 11 practices a week. They have a, two full-time coaches. They have a team of about 95 people. In order to go to their national championships, you have to be at six practices a week. So it's a neat opportunity to be part of something that's pretty serious if you want to go to Boulder that has the program that you want in environmental engineering or something along those lines. Um, and then NJSC, this is junior college. If you are somebody, if you have an athlete that is not eligible, so if you've gone through that eligibility center and you are not able to be recruited, which they will tell you as you go through it, this is a good stopping point. Indian River right up the road is one known for its athletes. You're, I mean... I remember being at coaching and recruiting kids from Indian River. After they finish their sophomore year, you get an associate's degree, and then you can go to a Division One school or Division Two school or Division Three school and compete at that next level. And they have a lot of success uh, moving on from that, which is pretty neat. All these athletes, have, you're doing this. If you decide to make this choice, it's because you want to swim and you want that ability to swim and you want a college degree. And this is a way to step into that a little softer, also helps you save money because usually they're a little bit cheaper than a four-year institution. So you get two years out of your way for less money. Um, there are 13 schools. Indian River's one of them. There's one in Iowa. There's one that's called a Fashion Institute, and it's actually focused in York, and they do a bunch of exchanges there if you like fashion design. And then lastly, when we talk about this, we're going to talk about Ivy League and military. These are two very special situations. Um, we'll talk about military first. You have to have a commendation from a governmental body, so you need to start that process your junior year. It actually takes a while. If you are incredibly, incredibly fast, the coaches there will help facilitate it for you. But if you are kind of, you know, in that winter junior to summer junior area, you've kind of got to work, you've got to have that ahead of time, and you've got to work with the uh, the the governmental bodies to get that recommendation, that commendation to get into the school and be considered for admission. Um, physical fitness is paramount. You have to pass the physical. I wanted to go to the Air Force more than anything else, and I could not pass the physical, so I didn't get to go to the Air Force. It's a sad story. Tear. Um, but that, uh, yeah, me behind a fighter jet. Take that. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be Top Gun, except Air Force. Um, you do report July, so your season ends effectively the end of June, your freshman year, and you w most likely will not compete with your club team again. Um, that's something you kind of just need to be aware of and be prepared for. You might come home and practice with them. You might go to one meet here or there, but by and large, once you go off, you are off. Um, Ivy League is another different category. Again, this is your Harvard, your Yale, your Columbia. Uh, they have a very rigorous academic course load. Um, you have to want to make that a priority. It is even more of a priority than it is at the Division Three level. Um, you need to, the process for recruiting is very slow. Uh, they're slowly turning the needle on that. It is getting a little bit quicker. But by and large, they take their time because they're looking at what the best class is across the school as a whole. You need to have aggressive test scores, and your GPA needs to be insane. You need to be taking a lot of AP classes. Um, you have to have an academic course load that is really rigorous. Uh, if you have, if you're, if you've got those summer junior cuts, that's going to help you. This is a situation where if you can go to college and have swimming help you get to a college that's the next level academically, this is probably the best demonstration of that. It, they only practice from October to March. Uh, which is the other component. They do not, they are not allowed to have practices before October. They usually are going to run captain's workouts uh, outside of that, but they're pretty loose, usually only about three or four times a week. Um, and most athletes at this level do not consistently train year round. That's why we saw some athletes from Harvard take a year off during the Olympic year so that they could go train in Texas and then go and train, swim at Harvard um, after that because they wanted to have that year round training environment that was just a little bit more positive. Um, from that standpoint. Um, again, volunteer and student involvement is really big here, so you have to be prepared for that as well. So that is we're pretty much at the end. Do you want me to finish up the last two pieces, or do you want to do that? Okay. All right. Other considerations? Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, so we, like I said, we, we added a little information this year, so we've, we've up. Our goal was 90 minutes. We're five minutes short of that, so I'm going to try to knock this out. But, yeah, if you can go ahead and put these up there. So a couple other things to think about. I mentioned this earlier. NIL, 
Um, <clears throat> again, it's not uh, – there's a whole lot of nuances to it. I can't say that we can speak – uh, fluently on it yet. I think it's one of those things that the swimming world is still discovering, but it's not something you need to count on. There are some ways that scholarship can be impacted by it or financially can be impacted by it. Um, second is a transfer portal. And I bring this up because you're seeing a lot more talk about the transfer portal, swimmers transferring. And the primary effect it is having is the cultural recruiting of athletes. P coaches are now looking into who the athletes are as people a little bit more. So you're getting a lot more questions to us that are saying, who is this person like? What are they like as a teammate? Um, how reliable are they? Are they consistent in front? Do they love what they're doing? Are they going to be bought in? Those kind of things. So they're because of this transfer portal process being a lot easier for athletes to leave. Uh, coaches want to make sure they're getting athletes that fit them culturally more than anything. Um, so you're seeing a lot more focus on that. Um, I also say it's not a good plan. Uh, to go somewhere thinking I'm just going to go to the transfer portal and you're like, hey, I didn't get to my first choice. I'm just going to go get into the transfer portal in a year and I'll go somewhere else. Um, it's really leaves a uh, – it can really damage if, – if you're leaving like that, a uh, coach can, can actually affect you down the line in terms of the support they give you. Um, it's also just – it's just not very good as far as, you know, showing the investment in the program. It's not something we would support. Um, obviously, if there's a problem, if there's something that's not going well, and the best situation for you is to leave it cool, we're here to help. Uh, but I think it's really important you're not looking at this process from a, I'm going to go somewhere and transfer. It's just not a good way to go through the, the experience. Um, like I mentioned this early in the beginning, scholarship structures are very different. They should not be compared directly back and forth. Um, there's a lot of different variations to that, but it's just something to consider. Uh, a lot of times you can get great academic scholarships, especially some of those D3 schools, D2 schools. Um, they give great academic aid that cannot can be combined with athletic aid, uh, but it can provide a better opportunity for you. Um, the last one is a gap year. Um, again, if this is a consideration for you, we'd love to have this conversation early. Um, it might be based on family matter uh, condition, might be based on age, might just be based on maturity, might be based on coursework, um, where you're coming from. We at Bowles have a unique uh, history with our international athletes coming. This might be a really important thing for some of them to consider uh, just based on where they're coming from, their academic curriculum. Uh, but it's, it's something we need to have a conversation about early. Uh, develop a plan around it and understand what some of the pros and cons are. Some of the reasons are really good. There are some cons that go along with it, uh, but it's something that everybody's allowed one year. So basically from when you start high school until you start college is five years. That you're allowed five years to complete high school. So that gives you that one extra year at the end if you would like to go take that before you start. And then after that, your eligibility in college is, is affected. So you have that gap year refers to that fifth year that you have to complete high school. Um, so last thing we have, just a couple of action items, and then we're going to um, you know, break it up from here. If there's any questions in the room, we'll take them. If you are online or watching later, please email us um, so we get an opportunity to support you. Uh, before I jump into this, I just want to say thanks to our coaching staff that put this together. Uh, we have a really, really high level and amount of college experience on our staff for a club program. Um, all of us have coached or swum at a uh, club level, even uh, somebody like Coach Melissa, who's not here today, has coached at several high-level universities, uh, been through several programs, has even taken over as an interim coaching position in some of those uh, at an SEC-level school, so she can really talk to this process and what it looks like uh, from the inside out as well. So we have, uh, we are here to support our student athletes the best we can, and we do that from a team standpoint. Um, it is not my, my role as a head coach alone to provide – there's going to be different people that connect different ways, and I want to make sure that we – just like we do with coaching, we want to make sure that all of our coaches are able to, to weigh in. Some of us might have advice or experiences or thought processes that are better for athletes or maybe think of something different than another athlete. And so as we go through this, we have lists in our office of all of our – all of our classes as we go through and how we can support and we would welcome that opportunity to uh, for any of us to work with you as uh, parents or athletes we kind of go through this um, so action items is for leaving today uh, freshman eighth graders just familiarize yourself with different colleges get used to the process look at swim cloud sophomores you need to make sure you have your eligibility center registration done We've had several juniors this year that went to go on recruiting trips and didn't have that completed yet. It kind of caused us a bit of an issue. So please go get that completed. There's a couple silly things on there. There's an amateurism retort. It's going to ask you questions like, have you ever gotten uh, free gear from your club? Um, you have not gotten free gear. We have not asked you to sponsor be a sponsor for bowls. We're not paying you to swim, right? So you answer no to that. But um, there's, there's a thing on there that will go through those kind of questions and your academic questions. Um, make sure you're, you're working on your uh, list of 20. So... 
for us right here in the room and for those online, we are trying to get to, if you're a sophomore, we'd love to see your list of 20 before June 1st, ideally in the month of May, um, sometime before exams kick in. That is your homework to do starting right now is to come up with that broad list of 20. Please do not feel like it has to be perfect. And if it's 21, that's fine. If it's 18, that's okay. Uh, but we need to get started. We need to start looking. We need to go. And then from that, we're going to say, we are going to be able to look at you and say, okay, great, great, great. You need to look a little bit more here, a little bit more here. We're fine tuning that. And then your job is going to be to send emails and questionnaires from that point. And what we can do to follow up is give you templates to do that with. We can give you ways to um, send that out. We can show you how to set those things up. But we want to have that engagement early on with that list of 20. It's our best way to support you uh, is to get that done. Um, juniors, if you're not already on this process, we need to work down to about 10 schools um, and start scheduling trips if that's something that's in your wheelhouse. If that's not something that's immediately on your wheelhouse, that's okay. We'd love to have that conversation. A lot of the things we talked about today kind of fell into that Division I uh, big category, but there are a lot of other pathways there. We want to make sure we're on top of where you're at, and we can just keep tabs. Like I said, we have a list in our office of where everybody is and what they're doing. We can update that, and we can share that information. Uh, we'd love to have the conversation with you. Uh, make sure you're scheduling your ACT and your SAT. Don't wait till the end, and then all of a sudden it's stuck on your big swim meet weekend. You have to go take the SAT. Go ahead and be proactive about that. Talk to us about next year's schedule. We have a pretty good idea already of what the fall looks like. That should be coming out in a couple of months, but if you need to schedule that, you need to let us know ASAP. Um, Parents, if you could just have that conversation amongst yourselves and then with your student athletes about finances, um, what does that look like? If you're ready to fill out, what information do you need to fill out financial aid forms as you go through the process? Um, and then I think having some conversations with expectations around communication in this process. What does it look like? How are we going to communicate? What are you going to update me on? What do you want to do? How do I know that you know, you're doing this or that? Or, or what are we going to do? Let's have some ground rules about this and let's make it fun. Uh, it's really important to have that conversation. Um, we would love to meet with everybody. I know that's a lot of meetings, uh, but we try to do this on a regular basis. We'll tie it into our goal meetings. But athletes, once you get that list of 20, don't send, uh, email it to us, send us in a text, and we can set up a quick meeting to run through it. We want to be more involved in this process. Process. Um, we really feel strongly that the college swimming sport is changing and we want to make sure we're working to stay ahead of that with our student athletes here. Um, and if for some of you, it might be a conversation about the best fit. It might be opening some other doors. Uh, for a lot of you, it's about staying on top of what that next step is in the process and working through it with you. Um, it's always awesome. We had our signing this morning, our last one of the year, um, and it's always awesome to see the end result of that process. So as, as stressful as it's going to be, as challenging it might be, um, it's a lot of fun to see that. And we as coaches know that for the most part, we are sending you off to do much bigger and better things than you will do at bowls. So it's exciting for us um, to see that process through and watch you guys uh, go on and be successful beyond this. But we want to make sure we're helping you as much as we can in that process. Um, if there's any other questions, please let us know as we finish up. I want to be respectful of your time. I went over about three minutes, darn it. Um, but we appreciate everybody coming out today. Those of you who are online, thank you for joining. And for those of you that are watching the recording, please let us know. Like I said, we're going to keep this up available for those to uh, go from there. So thank you.